welcome Mike Ungerman, a techie most of his life, who's from the Central Florida Computer Society, where he just started a Linux SIG. He has grown and matured through the technology age and has welcomed the age of personal computer, starting with a CompuColor 2. Anybody remember those? I don't. He built his first modem before 1980 and connected to mainframe computers. Mike embraced the world of online technology, joining some of the first electronic bulletin board systems. Later, he became the sysop of two different systems. He was a member of many of the early commercial online systems. He learned to program in HTML as the internet provided the platform for websites and has developed several websites himself. He was an early adopt adapter of social networks and is concerned about the direction they have been going regarding personal privacy, especially with Facebook. Mike is going to give us a bit of background into social media and end up with the one he uses that does regard everyone's privacy. I'll now turn the presentation over to Mike. And I have something, don't forget, we can still see you even though Mike is giving his presentation. Uh, John and Bill and I, we all turn our videos off. And we kind of recommend that you guys do that so we can't see what you're doing in case you're getting up and wandering around, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe if you turn your video off, you can eat. Okay. Well, as John said, I'm Mike Ungerman, past president of the Central Florida Computer Society and one of the first presidents of the Florida Association of Computer User Groups. Today's presentation, I'd like to talk about internet privacy as it applies to social networking systems and why we would, might want to choose an alternative to the social networking system that you're using. I'll review MeWe, a next generation, self-described next generation social network. Um, I'll do a, a live demonstration of my account and I'll cover a little bit on the professional version of MeWe, which has been designed for organizations and collaboration and for which I've been told is free for nonprofits, although I haven't been able to confirm it yet. And then do, we'll do a little Q&A at the end. So what is a social network? Dictionary definition, a network of individuals. But as we look at it, really an online service or site for which people create and maintain interpersonal relationships. And millions of us have become comfortable using smartphones, computers, tablets and so on to share information about yourselves uh, via mobile apps that access social networks such as Facebook and Twitter. And the economists came up with that definition. Man's ability to communicate with others appears to go a long way back. Don't these cave paintings resemble today's emojis? I was really struck by that when I saw this graphic. And we tend to take today's communication systems for granted, but Way back in 550 BC, the mail, consisting of clay tablets, was delivered allowing people to chat with each other and reply. The Assyrians uh, had that uh, benefit. Fast forward past smoke signals and we get to the telegraph and we come into the electric age of interaction. Ah, the telephone. Presumably, Mr. Watson was able to hear over the first telephonic device and respond to Mr. Bell and become the first audio chat. Commercial radio wasn't really two-way, but it brought us into the electronic entertainment age. I'm old enough to remember sitting around the console radio in our living room, really dating myself, and getting the news as well as listening to the serials. Who knows what evil lurks in the heart of men? The shadow knows. How many of you remember that? Yeah, I'm dating myself. So early computers, mainframe computers, communicated with each other by coding punch cards or tapes. And eventually the arrival of networking over cables came into our technology and true network communications were established between computers and those people sitting at the consoles could communicate with each other. 
In the 60s and 70s, the ARPA and DARPA networks were established. In one of my Navy assignments, while I was still on active duty, I actually received a demonstration of DARPANET with communication between users of two government computers at two different locations. And we were able to chat, send each other email, send files, and so on. So really not social networking, but it, it was communications. And how many of you remember the good old days of 150 baud? Using a telephone and a modem allowed connecting from a terminal in an office or at home to a mainframe computer. Rudimentary email was available even then. My first exposure to electronic bulletin board systems or BBS was while I was assigned to Washington DC in 1983. I was an owner of an Apple II computer at that time. I joined the Washington Apple Pie user group and a smaller Northern Virginia Apple user group called Novapple. Each had their own BBS system running pro Apple software. I eventually became a co-sop on both of them. A key feature of pro Apple systems was the ability to dial up to a Unix based system and exchange email between other pro Apple system users. It was really very sophisticated for the time. When I came here to Orlando in the mid eighties, I joined the Central Florida Computer Society and participated with their implementation of a PC board bulletin board system, at various times being sysop and co-sysop with other members. I joined the source when it first came out. It even came with a thick printed instruction manual. My first social interaction with people from all over the world on the source was in a section called an author's forum where each person would write a paragraph and a continuing story when it was their turn. We used dial up modem connections and they had moved up from 150 baud then to 300 baud then to 2400 baud over this period. So downloads only took hours instead of days. And my sessions on the source were sort of a daily batch rather than real-time communications. But who of you didn't get AOL discs in the mail? Even CDs pressed into plastic inserts and distributed in the covers of tech magazines. I dare to say that most of us online now at one time or another used one of these commercial systems to communicate. So now with the inception of the internet, true social networks started to appear. On the upper left, does anyone recall six degrees? I had never heard of it before until I researched this event. And how many of these logos do you recognize? And did you have accounts on them? And do you today? So what I did is make up two tables, since I couldn't all get them in one, with a little summary of each one, attempted to do it in chronological order, except I can see right now I'm a little bit out of sequence here. But that six degrees that I mentioned was the inception was 1997. And even at that date, they had a peak of 3.5 million users around the world. That's pretty significant. And notice, they're the lowest in this column. LinkedIn for professional networking. Uh, I had a resume on LinkedIn back then. 740 million users today and operating. Friendster, well, Aaron, I have to admit, there's another one I didn't know about. Incepted in, in 2002, but they got to 115 million users before they closed a couple of years ago in 2018. They converted to a gaming site. Photo bucket wasn't so much social networking, but sharing of pictures and with comments. And then they were forwarded to other social networks so that you could actually post pictures in your posts on those, on those networks. They got to a max of 100 million users and then were sold. And the people that bought them decided they needed to make money, so they were going to start charging for it, and they, they dropped out. 
uh, on my recent check, uh, I couldn't even get to their site, although um, it says they're up, but I couldn't get to it. So the first real big network that was like Facebook and others of that genre was MySpace. It was pretty much the entertainment industry and then fans of fans of actors and, and songsters and singers and music and bands and so on. And they, at their peak, reached 115 million users. Many of you may have had accounts, if not perhaps your um, sons or daughters or their, their children. Um, and they were in direct competition with Facebook that came out a year later. And that competition went on for a couple of years, but you can see Facebook just really outpaced them. My latest uh, figures on Facebook are 2.8 billion members. Uh, that's, that's, that's a number that's hard to fathom, but 2.8 billion around the world. Photo sites were, were popular, Flickr, came in 2004. They were linked to Yahoo for a while until they became independent. They're still active. And although the current figures say they only have 112 million, imagine saying only 112 million, but the stats today when I checked it were greater than 10 billion images. That's, that's pretty significant. And not on this chart, the stats showed me that 25 million new images are uploaded daily. Reddit, with which mainly, I'm going to say most of you probably are not aware of, those who are highly technical might be, sort of a bulletin board system reimagined for the internet age. Some of my hardware and software actually use Reddit as the forums for their tech support. And they're doing pretty good, 430 million. And they're still operating today. YouTube, what can we say? Um, YouTube sort of replaced the uh, My Family Videos TV show as people first started just uploading short videos of, of friends and family and, and cute little videos. And now today, um, there's greater than 100 billion hours of videos uploaded daily. And stop and think about that. An hour of video, how long does it take to upload? And 100 billion hours of videos every day. In fact, that breaks down to 500 hours uploaded every minute. It was acquired by Google in 2006 for $1.65 billion. So they got the idea that this, this was definitely gonna be a cash cow for them. And their latest stats are 2.3 billion users. Twitter, uh, when most of us started using smartphones or even back to the flip phones, we could text each other. And of course, with a flip phone with a keyboard, being as difficult as it is to type on, and some were very proficient, we didn't have very long text to type. So Twitter sort of came out in the, in the mid time between those flip phones and the smartphones and allowed sort of an internet SMS texting service. And it was initially limited to 32 character tweets. And now, lately, they've been expanded to full microblogging, including audio and video of up to 140 seconds. Their latest stats that I was able to find, 330 million users. Spotify, focused on audio streaming of copyrighted music and podcasts. More than 70 million songs are archived on Spotify with 356 million users. Many people stopped buying uh, CDs, tapes, records, and they'll just stream their music from Spotify now. WhatsApp, and here's the big number for you, is an app that is really voice over IP. So it's internet telephony. And it allowed users around the world with an app on their phone to use their phone through WhatsApp 
to actually place calls to another user around the world. Extensively used, obviously, and now purchased by Facebook with some controversy, which I'll mention when we get into the uh, alternatives and, and why alternatives. But there's quite a bit of controversy on the personal information that's stored on WhatsApp. Pinterest uh, is kind of a unique social app. If you haven't actually looked at it, if you think of it as being a cork board hanging on your wall and you put pictures of your kids or pictures of your hobbies, I've got Corvettes on my wall and it's, it's on the internet. Your account on the internet is really a pin board in which you can put all kinds of interesting pictures and crafts. So with that as their format, they have managed to garner 400 million users and um, it's still operating and doing fairly well. Instagram is another media sharing site also acquired by Facebook. One billion bucks again, it's one billion users, one billion bucks. And Instagram is, you know, for selfies and for, for pictures. And they had a short-term life when they were posted. Their competition in 2011, not quite up to that billion mark of users is Snapchat. But I know uh, my granddaughter, and my, uh, my son and, and uh, daughter-in-law both use Snapchat extensively for sharing family uh, pictures. And you can attach stories to those pictures as well. Discord's a social media system that many of you probably haven't heard of unless you're a gamer. Discord, again, is very much like a, a bulletin board system. It's organized into various different subject matter within an account or what they call a server. And it, it does have the ability to do audio and video chats, as well as to have group-oriented and subject-oriented posts. Uh, last year for the Central Florida Computer Society, I set up a Discord system and fashioned it very much after the bulletin board system that we used to have back in the 90s. And we tried it out. So far, it hasn't caught on. But they're doing pretty good right now with 140 million people involved. And I'm sure there's more people playing games than there are that are on Discord, but just about every game has its own Discord channel. So given the growth of what is now considered mainstream social media, along with what I've shown you so far as participation in the millions and billions, there, there has been a dark side to the adoption of social networking. At least that's my opinion. Extensive revelations of problems have been identified, including data mining and security breaches. We hear about those every day in the news and the security news. So let's take a look at some of the reasons why one might consider an alternative to the social media system that they're presently using or a new social media, if you're thinking about adopting one, if they're available. The first I'm gonna talk about is fact checking of posts because that's one that affected me and helped convince me that maybe it was time to look elsewhere. So I tried to remain neutral as far as partisanship goes as I researched this presentation. It is impossible to avoid a conclusion that fact-checking taking place in social media is biased. Now, if, if you identify as a liberal, you might agree with a lot of the fact-checking, unless future elections swing in the other direction. If you identify as a conservative, you might vehemently disagree with fact-checking and want to change your exposure. If you identify as an independent or any identification, all of us should want objective fact checking. Fact checking should be facts, not opinions, and shouldn't be a, a you know, should not be influenced by the partisanship, partisanship of those actually doing the fact checking. At the bottom, I list a link, and when you get a copy of this, these links should be active. I see right now, putting my mouse over it, it is active, so I can click on it and actually go to it on my browser. So you should be able to see one of many sites that as I research this, 
pretty much verified what I thought and then gave additional references. So if you get past fact checking, it really, you might be able to overlook it. You might say, well, that's mild, I can live with it. Whether you agree with the fact checking or not, or you agree with what the original post was that the fact checking came up with. However, step it up a bit and posts can be censored or removed completely. So many social media sites go beyond fact checking to actually censoring posts. And some probably should. I mean, according to IPS News, another active link, and I'm quoting, some censorship is natural. All terms of service will have some censorship required. For instance, you should not share obscene imagery. You should not knowingly share fake news or create it. However, restricting people to express their social opinions for enforcing a strict regime is another story. Now, no one is forced to use the platform that they're using if they don't like it. You can always leave. But the lack of available and viable alternatives to some means that social media has a monopoly over information sharing today. Censorship isn't only imposed by some of those internet websites or those forums or the social media that those websites may in fact include. And some governmental agencies or other governments in other countries will actually step in to censor certain contact. So again, if this is a subject you want to research, I recommend this site to you. Okay, what happens if a post is censored? Well, removing the post, that's obviously censorship. But suppose your post is subtly interfered with and you don't know it. That's called shadow banning. So again, based on my research, a site from Social Panic, um, reports on a number of actions were taken both by Twitter and Facebook and perhaps other social media sites to shadow ban a post. So what does that mean? Well, Twitter apparently inadvertently acknowledged that it regularly uses shadow bans in their operation. Shadow bans can take more than one form. One is that when you post something, only you see it. Okay, you tweet it, it's on your screen. And you think you're live and that post just got posted. You might even go to your account and see it there. But actually the Twitter algorithms, once somebody has chosen to shadow ban you, has hidden it. And it's not visible to anyone else, whether they follow you or not. The other approach is that your tweets do go live, but Twitter shows them exclusively to people who already follow you. And you may be posting something publicly that you want to share and hope that other people will follow you as well. And they don't show up in the searches of Twitter content. Now, the terms of service of just about all social networking sites will state how your personal information will be used if you use their platform. But more may be going on than a simple database of your information. So let's take a look at how social media sites are gathering personal information for marketing and perhaps targeting users' activities across all of the internet in order to do that. There is a field called OSINT, OSINT, and it's called Open Source Intelligence. I, I was involved a little bit with some intelligence in the Navy, so I guess these acronyms uh, were known even back then. Gathering, gathering intelligence from open source posts and information. And there are debates between privacy advocates and open source intelligence researchers about whether the information on social media sites should be free and available and used that way. Again, from this site down here at the bottom, secjuice.com on social media intelligence, I quote, although the majority of social media sites require their users to register before accessing site contents in full, 
Many surveys show that social media users expect to have some form of privacy for their online activities, even when posting content with public access. However, OSINT experts generally consider information shared on social media sites as belonging to the OSINT domain because it's public information shared on public online platforms, and thus they feel it can be exploded for intelligence purposes, something we need it to at least be aware of. One such exploit of OSINT, at least as, as described, was the reveal in 2018 that Cambridge Analytica harvested Facebook user data. The data was collected through Cambridge Analytica's app called This Is Your Digital Life from up to 87 million Facebook profiles and used for political purposes. When I say used, that means they were paid to do it. And as a result, during that period of time and with the revelation, Facebook stopped. Plummeted. In April 2018, Facebook apologized for the role in the data harvesting, and their CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, testified in front of Congress. In July 2019, it was announced that Facebook was to be fined $5 billion by the Federal Trade Commission. In the UK, Facebook agreed to pay a 500,000 pound fine for exposing the data of its users to a serious risk of harm. Related then to this reveal, Cambridge Analytica went out of business. And the scandal sparked an increase in public interest in privacy and social media's influence on politics. Moving on, you can't be exposed to today's news without hearing of at least one celebrity or political figure whose account has been canceled. But it's not only the high visibility accounts that are being threatened. There's some good reasons why a social media account might be suspended, canceled, even banned for life if that term sounds familiar if repeated violations of sites terms of service continue, then there are some reasons that people might take issue with the process, which I did myself. So my experience, small one, but one that, that did impact me, I reposted a video that I received an email link for that took me to a publicly posted YouTube video related to COVID-19 alternative therapies. I thought the video was fairly innocuous. It was talking about supplements. It was talking about using off-label pharmaceutical products to help treat COVID-19. But I got a warning from YouTube almost immediately after I posted it again on my channel if I did not remove the video. They told me in their notice to me that if I didn't remove that video myself, they didn't remove it if I didn't remove it myself, that my account could be suspended or permanently canceled. I didn't get a notice that I could have fact checkers look at it. And in fact, the original video was itself not fact checked, nor was I given any opportunity to appeal that notice. So given that I'm a premium member of YouTube and I use it on a regular basis, I had complied with their direction. I removed the public post I had shared. Just my own personal experience, there is an, a number of references covering all sides of this policy in this history of social media bans. Again, a link that, that can be shared. So, nope, what I'm really looking at is what really affects your reasons why you would want to leave a social media site besides censorship. Now, we have found, in re again in research, nearly two-thirds of U.S. adult social media accounts have been hacked. Two-thirds. Keep in mind that the figures I gave you before were looking at, at accounts in the billions. 
especially the Facebook accounts that are in three billions. So according to Security Magazine, in this link, all social media has grown. So too has the number of criminals preying on those who use it. Nearly two in three US adults who have personal social media profiles say they're aware that their accounts have been hacked and 86% agree they limit personal information they post due to the fear of it being accessed by hackers. Social media sites themselves may promote and lead users to believe that their information and data are secure. And they may lead you through self-selected security settings. Even on your phones in your, in your settings, you may be pushed in that direction. However, cybersecurity criminals can often get around basic passwords and uncover personal information. One such instance of this is when in 2019, hundreds of millions of phone numbers linked to Facebook accounts were found online by researchers. The server that contained these uh, phone numbers had more than 419 million records over a number of databases on users across many geographies, including 133 million records on US, on U, of US users, 18 million records of users in the UK, and amazingly more than 50 million users in Vietnam. Who would have thought Vietnam would have 50 million users? And although this incident took place in 2019, it was kept quiet until it was made, it was revealed to the public in early 2021, when many people who saw that reveal said, oh, well, this is old news and Facebook's taken care of it. Doesn't change the fact that hundreds of millions of phone numbers were actually linked. How closely then do you read the terms of service of the social networks you participate in? as far as the ownership of your data? The short answer, again, business to community to come quote, is the app or social media platform owns your data, if it's outlined in their terms of service, and most do, and is the only way to control your data by having an avoidance relationship with social media entirely, the smarter devices on the market become, the more naturally vulnerable we are to losing personal control of the data we supply. So here we come to my friend, MeWe, a social media platform I switched to after dropping Facebook. Mark Weinstein is the CEO of MeWe. He's quite outspoken. He has been a uh, TED speaker on social media privacy, if those of you that watch TED Talks. And his recent post on MeWe, when it was revealed that what apps users have to share their data was to say, hey, it's MeWe time. As of May 15th, Facebook mandated that all WhatsApp users share their private personal data with Facebook. And he went on to be uh, a little bit vocal in saying, hey, that's, that's not something that should have taken place. He continues, never mind that when this acquisition was about to take place, that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg had promised WhatsApp member data would remain private and separate, and he used the term forever when he bought the app. So again, he says, one bright light in this darkness, MeWe and goes on to say, MeWe will never sell out to Facebook. And certainly that's been one of the concerns that many people looking at MeWe have had. And MeWe members have the industry's only written member privacy bill of rights. It's in their terms of service to ensure your own data and your privacy is your absolute right. Here's a screenshot from mewe.com privacy. And I know that as I show this on your screens, it may be hard for you to read um, later on when, when we're live. If, if there's interest, I can enlarge the screen, but I'll paraphrase a couple of them. 
Number one, you own your personal information and content. That's different where other sites will say the content that you post on our site is ours. You never receive targeted third-party advertisements or targeted third-party content. This is a site that does not use advertising as a revenue model. You have full control over your newsfeed and the order of how posts appear. Full control. It's not going to be fact-checked. It may be censored for some of the key items I spoke about before for things that don't want on a site. But other than that, you've got full control of what you post and they won't manipulate it, filter it, or change the order of your news feeds or decide for that matter, well, we're not gonna post this publicly because you don't have a big enough following, which some sites do. Permissions and privacy are your rights. You control them and you can control who can access your content. You can opt out of their membership directory and they're not gonna sell your personal information to anyone. They also are not gonna do facial recognition. And you can delete your account and take your content with you, which many sites will let you do anyway. But at any rate, here's the link for that, which you can go to. So what I'd like to do is show you a few screenshots before I go live and show you some of the free features that MeWe has. Here is a MeWe timeline. And it should look kind of familiar to Facebook. You've got a column that shows you some basic functions. You do have your contacts. I have blacked out, covered up my contacts for privacy purposes for this demonstration. Across the top, you have functions of, of home, chats, groups, pages, calendar. You can search for members and groups. You can see your own profile. You get your own profile photos if you like. And you'll get some alerts to things that are waiting for you to read since the last time that you logged in. And you get a timeline in the center. Here's a post that I put up promoting the fact that there is a Solar United Neighbors organization around the country that helps people go solar. Here's a sample of a post that my son posted with my comment. So it's very similar again to what you can do on Facebook. My son wanted to show his granddaughter and my great granddaughter as she was helping paint the house. And you can see we have typical emojis that get posted when, uh, when somebody sees a cute post and I can even emoji with a, with a picture and the picture gets emojied. You can chat and chats again are very much like chats in just anywhere else. They can be photo chats. I have a nephew who wanted to know if I was old enough to remember Microsoft kiosks. And I responded to him. You also have video and voice chats. And as John Kennedy and I found out yesterday, a paid user can in fact initiate a video chat or a voice chat, but a person using the basic free account can only receive them. Not something that I really enjoy, but I understand based on their business model that now they're going to charge for things like this. And if you, all you wanted was to add this, that would be $2 a month to get voice and video chats. You have groups. Groups are very much, again, like Facebook. There are open groups that are fully public. There are semi-private groups where you have to meet certain requirements in order to post. And there are private groups that you have to be invited to. So if you just go to the group section, you will see a chronological order of the waiting posts from the groups and you could just scroll down through them. Or you can choose the group you actually want to go to and then read the posts and reply to them in that group. And as I'll show you in a few minutes when we go live, you can also take a look at the open groups. And there, when in one of the statistics I saw was a couple of years ago when they, right after they first formed, there was something like 19,000 public groups available on MeWe. 
So there's many public groups and many different subjects that you can subscribe to and take a look at. Here's the private group that I set up for our family, wedding picture of, of our granddaughter. Kind of kind of nice to share. Um, I don't have full participation yet of the family. I'm working on it. Um, but my son has joined and he's starting to post some information. And in that group, I've created a photo album. Again, albums very much like on Facebook. This is our great granddaughter, Meadow. And I followed her from a young baby uh, to uh, a year and a half old, which we saw her just last month. And anyone in the family that's in this can add a photo. And I haven't yet tried a video. I think videos can also be added to these albums, but I have to check that out. Pages are just like pages on Facebook. They also are monetized in that if it's a commercial organization and they want to promote their product, they can have a product page and they'll, page for, they'll pay for that use. Uh, here's, a, here's a page from VetViews Magazine. <clears throat> Being a Corvette enthusiast, I like to follow the pictures and the things that are there. I also follow Mike Huckabee as a political commentator and I get his daily posts. Calendars are tied either to your mainstream or to the groups that you're in. So here's a calendar that I created in a Corvette group with upcoming Corvette events. And you can see that the events show up here and they also appear by date in the calendar. And any member of the group can create an event for that calendar or you and your own page can create your own and put in birthdays and upcoming events for yourself. Premium features. Okay, so this is how MeWe makes money, okay? With no advertising, no collecting of your data, um, they've got to make money somehow. And so if it attracts people like by itself, <clears throat> then at $5 a month or $60 a year, if nothing else, I'm getting no advertising at all on my timeline. And that I really appreciate. Plus, I like the fact that the privacy, at least as stated in their terms of service, is, is much better than the sites that I've left. Plus, if you like, you can get video journals where your stories can be archived in a journal. You do get the unlimited voice and video calling. I'm not sure that I'll use that feature. I have it, but I may use other voice and video calling that we have as well. I do like the fact that I can get 100 gigabytes of MeWe cloud storage and then up to 500 gigabytes if I want to expand it. So let's take a look at MeWe now that we've talked about it a little bit. Take me a second here to get the right screen up. There we go. Okay, we're live. So <clears throat> I'm not gonna extend this out because I've pretty well covered what's actually there, but I'll show it to you live. So again, if I, I, I have my contacts here that I could chat with, I can go to my chat pages. And again, I have it set up for groups. There's my chats in the Linux group, if I want to go back through it. Here are my groups. And again, as I mentioned, it will start showing me posts in the groups and obviously a Corvette group. And then I can scroll down and see the posts that are there. Or I can choose to actually go to the group. I can go to it uh, as shown up here, or I can go to it excuse me, by actually going here. Now you're in the full group with their group photo. The same post. Posts can be tagged so that you can find posts that, that you know, that they're there. The group chat is here so that you can go back and you can see the chats that people have posted. 
I also get alerts and the alerts will tell me who've commented. There's even today's Wednesday workshop and more comments on posts and emojis and so on. So anything that's new will show up here. And I do have my own profile page, my contact page, my cloud storage, and any feedback that I'd like to give them. Okay, let's try to get there. Uh, I'm having a problem, hang on a moment. There we go, I think. You know, I wound up with Mike Huckabee. So, okay, there we go, Vet Views Magazine. So again, here's the page. And you can see it's very similar to a group. I can't originate a post in a group, but the group owner can allow me to comment if I like and to emoji it. So if I like the fact that there's a sports car racing program, I'll, I'll give her a thumbs up for that. And you get the thumbs up, very similar. Okay. So these are the basic features of MeWe. Uh, we do have the MeWe store starting at the top. You can go premium anytime you want. If you want to check out premium and you try MeWe for 30 days, it will be in the premium mode, or you can upgrade to premium at any time. As I said, that's $60 a year, $5 a month. You can buy in addition emojis and stickers. That really doesn't appeal to me, but there are a lot of people that like that. Um, you can have pages specifically to support your business, and that's $2 a month. And I have unlimited voice and video calling now with my premium, so that's included. So actually my $5 a month is actually $3 a month with voice and video. And I have the 100 gigabytes of cloud storage in my premium account, but you can get uh, eight gigabytes for $399, which doesn't make much sense, 50 gigabytes to 100 gigabytes or 500 gigabytes if all you wanted was additional cloud storage. Okay, so what I'm gonna do at this point Go back to the presentation very quickly. And I'm looking to see where it should have been there. Okay. All right, I'm not in that page. So hang on a moment. I want to get where we are. Oh, there we go. Okay, live demo. All right, I'm going to briefly mention. MeWe Pro, since we, so we have 10 minutes for questions left. <clears throat> for a fee, an organization can go uh, with MeWe Pro with many additional features. Groups and subgroups get expanded. Think of it as departments in a corporation and then divisions or divisions and departments. Uh, in an organization, it could be a board of directors and then a special interest group if, if a user group wanted to do it. And there's their advanced intergroup news feeds, searching, permissions, guest access, and so on. Um, next gen chat and private posts. They're basically saying this could re replace email between members. So I'm interested in seeing how that would work out, especially notifications. Calendars and events can be tied to groups, and they can also sync with Outlook, Google Calendar, and iCal. One of the features I've been interested in through my entire career in information technology is real-time sharing and collaboration of information. So I look forward to seeing exactly how one can share and edit simultaneously with Office and Google Drive. Fun and engaging. Well, we want our work to be fun.
Mike, we lost your volume. I'm sorry, here is the best features with lowest price. Um, <clears throat> the, um, what we're looking at is $4 a month for unlimited users, 50 gigabytes for storage per member, and a gigabytes maximum file size, $8 for the gold plan, the premium plan hasn't come out yet. Security is their top priority. And uh, again, there, there's lots of security features. If you go to the MeWe Pro site, it's there. And if one of the questions is on security, I can come back to that and we can talk about it. So based on that, let me close my screen. And open it up to questions. And I apologize for the loss of audio there. I'm fighting a bit of a cough and sucking cough drops as I go. So hopefully I didn't cut out too much of it. So let us have the questions. Judy, do you want to feed a couple now and then a few later? Yeah, I only have four questions. So let's see how we get through them. Can you use... Can you use WhatsApp on your laptop without a smartphone? As I understand it, and in the research that I did, WhatsApp requires a telephone number in order to establish the account. Then, once the account is established, you can, in fact, use it on a laptop. Actually, Facebook is very difficult. Do you have any suggestions? I missed the first word. Facebook is difficult. For what Try, reason? Trying to leave Facebook is very difficult. Do uh, you have any suggestions? Well, um, for me to leave Facebook, I Googled it. Or I duck, duck, goed it. <laughs> and it gave a step-by-step -step how to go into your security settings, your privacy settings, and and work your way down. There isn't, there isn't a top level button that says close your account, but it is there. And you can, for example, get a complete archive of all the pictures you've uploaded to Facebook. So that's good. Um, and if I remember correctly, I was able to get an archive of posts that I originated, not that I plan on going back and looking at, at any of them. But yes, you can leave it. Now, did I leave Facebook right away? No. I, I looked for an alternative starting back in uh, December, if I remember correctly. Started playing with MeWe and looking at other alternatives. And then I started inviting people to MeWe. And when I got a few on MeWe that were also friends on Facebook, then is when I started making plans to leave Facebook by the end of the year. And I had posted on Facebook, I was going to leave by December 31st. And on January 1st, that, that was my last post saying goodbye. Does MeWe run on PC and Mac as well as other mobile phone platforms? Yes, <clears throat> PeeWee runs on Macs and PCs. They have an Android app and an iOS app. Now, I know John Kennedy tried it out and I've tried it out too. I don't find the ease of use of MeWe as a phone app to be the best in the world. You can, in fact, and if I'd had another hour, I probably would have done it. You can go side by side in each app. You can look at your timeline and you can get your timeline on the phone. You can look at the groups and you can look at the groups on the phone. You look at the pages and you can see the pages on the phone. So, and you can chat. So I like it for me anyway, as a Facebook clone. Now, yesterday I was talking with Huey Poplot, who's a friend that, that many of you know that's here online. And he joined me on MeWe. And he said, Mike, I've been on MeWe now um, two, two months and I don't have any followers. Well, my initial answer was, yeah, because you haven't posted publicly. 
the privacy is working. In other words, people aren't finding you <clears throat> and attempting to become your contact because you haven't published anything publicly. And it's like any system you get on, you start and you invite somebody and then they join you and then they invite someone and so on and so on and the word gets out. So my choice was try to use it for friends and family and at least initially post things that would be interesting to them, which I've been doing. And then sessions like today make people aware of it so that they might consider it as an alternative. I have some more questions now and we will revisit que these questions uh, at the end of Joe's presentation as well as his questions. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention and back to you. Great, thanks so much. That was a good presentation and we'll probably have um, more. If you have any other questions, put them in the chat box. Uh, if we don't get to them, we will send them to Mike and he will answer and reply back to Judy and she will uh, add those to the follow-up material, which by the way, will go out to everyone that we can match up their name on the Zoom with the name and email address that's on the uh, Google form that you filled out to register. If you don't, we aren't gonna be able to find you. If you have questions for Joe during this part, it'll be helpful if you put a J in front of questions for Joe and an M in front of questions for Mike. Again, for anybody who's uh, came in later, uh, we are recording this. If you do not want your face to be recognized when we upload this to YouTube, you just need to click the little button that says turn off your video. At this time, it's my pleasure to welcome back Joe Kissel, author and publisher of Take Control Books. His presentation today is a repeat of his excellent workshop he did for our VTC, Your Online Privacy. We apologize for the many people that weren't able to attend through a technical difficulty, uh, but he is back for those of us who heard him once and wanna hear him again and for the new people. Joe is a best-selling, award-winning, hyphen overusing author and technologist. His company bought Take Control Books in 2017, and he writes about a variety of interesting things, including Macs and iOS devices, and enjoys making complicated topics easy to understand. He likes to think of himself as a generalist rather than a specialist. Joe grew up in the U.S., married a Canadian, spent more than five years in Paris, and now lives out in San Diego. Joe will give us practical advice that we need to handle common online privacy problems and to develop a sensible online privacy strategy customized for our needs. My pleasure to turn the presentation over to Joe. Thank you very much. It's uh, very nice to be with you again, uh, or for the first time, for those of you who uh, were not with us earlier. Uh, we're gonna be talking about online privacy today. It's a big topic. It's potentially a scary topic. When uh, I told a friend of mine several years ago that I was gonna be writing a book about online privacy, he said, well, that's gonna be a short book. As if to say, there is no such thing. And there is a kernel of truth to what my friend said, but there are still a lot of things you can do to increase your privacy, and we're going to be talking about them today. So let me share my screen here. Uh, hmm, interesting. There we go. All right. So we're going to take control of our online privacy today. And... Uh, I do want to mention, just as a little commercial here at the beginning, uh, as, as John told you, I'm the publisher of Take Control Books. We have ebooks on a wide variety of tech topics. Some of them are geared specifically toward Apple users. Some of them are platform neutral, like the one we're talking about today. But uh, regardless of what kind of device or devices you use, I'm sure you'll find a lot there to like. And we love user groups. So 
we would like you to uh, have 30% off of any or all of our books. There's a code there that you can jot down. We hope you will come back again and again and use that code to save 30% on any of our eBooks. And that's our gift to you. And it, that includes, of course, the book that I'll be uh, referring to this morning. And you can find us at takecontrolbooks.com. I will put that coupon code up again at the end for anyone who missed it. So let's get right into the presentation. What do we mean when we're talking about online privacy? Again, it is a big topic. It could mean lots of different things. So what we're going to talk about today is some of the risks to your privacy, who wants your private information and why, and what kinds of steps you can take to deal with that. Now, I want to point out that this is not a one-time thing. I can't tell you, just do the following five things and your online privacy is great forever. I wish I could tell you that. Unfortunately, this is a dynamic thing. The bad guys, and there are a lot of them, and we might define bad guy differently, one person to the next, but in any case, the people who want information about you that you don't want them to have are constantly changing their game. They're looking for new ways to get information from you. And you have to, to, to a certain extent, keep up with what they're up to and keep addressing your own privacy strategy. Now, I know some people who think that they should be able to use the internet completely privately and completely anonymously. And that, I'm just going to tell you right up front, is completely wrong. It's, it's not possible. You can't do it. It can't be done. Now, <clears throat> there are a lot of things you can do to increase your privacy, and we'll be talking about those. But it is not possible to be 100% completely private when you are online. You can be mostly private, but there will be some people and businesses and government agencies and so forth that will be able to know certain things about you. And actually, that's okay. If you want total privacy, you can go live in a cave someplace and not have contact with any other human beings. For most of us, that's not what we want. We want to shop online. We want to get information online. We want to exchange emails and text messages with our friends. We want to socialize. We want to have all the conveniences that the internet offers. We just have to make certain allowances when we're doing that. It's just like if you go to a store in person, somebody could recognize you there or your image could be caught on a security camera someplace. If you want the convenience of being able to go in public and shop, you have to give up a certain amount of privacy. Ordinary people, that's, I believe, most of us, you and me, can still basically uh, lock down the most serious threats to our privacy. Now, when I say ordinary people, with ordinary privacy, privacy needs. I have to say, I am excluding certain groups of people. I am excluding celebrities. I'm excluding politicians. I'm excluding the super wealthy. And I'm excluding anyone who might fall under the watchful eye of the government. Here's, here's you know, our, our good friends in, in Fort Meade who just love to pay attention to what's going on online. So if you're a person that fits in one of those categories, if you're a, an Edward Snowden, if you're a whistleblower, if you are a journalist working on something very, very sensitive, your needs extend beyond, your, your privacy needs extend beyond what I can help you with today. That's not to say that your situation is hopeless, just that that's outside of the scope of what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about military grade, lock everything down. Now I've noticed as I've talked to a lot of people about privacy and security 
over the years, and I've written books and articles on both of those topics, that there is some confusion. There's some words that people tend to sort of jumble up together. And I want to just break these out because it's important to know what we're actually talking about and what your goals are. So we'll start with the word privacy, and that's freedom from observation or attention. That is, you're doing whatever you're doing without other people seeing that you're doing that. All right, so that's privacy. Then there's a second term and that's security. That's freedom from danger or harm. Now, you might think that those two concepts go together a lot and they often do go together a lot. Some of the things that you can do to make yourself more secure, that is more safe, also enhance your privacy as a side effect and vice versa, but you can have one without the other. Then there's a third thing, anonymity. And that's where somebody might know what you're doing, but they don't know who you are. So that's a totally different thing. Again, there are ways of combining anonymity with privacy and or security, but there is no guarantee that fixing one of those problems fixes the other. Now, if these concepts aren't yet entirely clear, and in particular, if you don't understand how you can have one without the other, I'm going to break this down for you. I'm going to use a bear. I think everything you need to know about the differences among privacy and security and anonymity, we can learn from a bear. Now, I just read this morning <laughs> that uh, there was a video of somebody at a national park who, who what really wanted to take a picture of there was a, a, a mama bear with a cub and they got out of their car and got kind of close and then the mama bear uh, charged at the, the tourist. They were okay, but you know, bears are, are, are cuddly looking. They can also be extremely dangerous. So think about going to the zoo and seeing bears at the zoo. Now, depending on the layout of the zoo, this is just one example, you are quite some distance from the bears. Hey, there's a moat in between you and the bears. Also, you got a tall wall and you got maybe some plexiglass, some fencing. What you have here is security. And the security works both ways. You are protected from the bears. That is, you are protected from harm by the bears. Also, the bears are protected from you. It's two-way security. That's nice. What you don't have here is privacy. Well, everybody's just out in public. You can see other people. Other people can see you. You can see the bears. The bears can see you. Now, I don't think the bears are particularly worried about privacy, but they don't have any privacy from you either. They can't really hide. There is a lot of security here, but there is no privacy. Now, let's flip it around. Let's say you go camping and you are out in the woods. There is not a soul around as far as you can see, just trees. You are there in your tent. And if you go into your tent in the middle of the woods, maybe you're, you're there with a companion and the two of you can have a very private conversation because nobody can see you and nobody can hear you. Whatever happens in the tent is going to be private. You have privacy. What you don't have is security because the only thing between you and the outside world is a thin little piece of nylon. So if a bear happened to wander by and see your tent, you would not be safe. Private, yes. Safe, no. You have privacy. You don't have security. A bear could just swipe right through that tent. Now, you will have anonymity, which is to say that the bear doesn't know who you are, only that you were delicious, and nobody else will know who you were either until the coroner comes and examines your remains. So you had an anonymity at a certain point that will disappear. Privacy, security, anonymity, three different things. Now, if instead of being in a nylon tent, you were in a brick house, like, you know, the, the smart 
one of the three little pigs, if the bear maybe couldn't have gotten in, you would have had both privacy and security. So some of the things we can do to increase our security also increase our privacy and vice versa. It's just not necessarily the case. And what is true of you interacting with a bear is also true online. So what does online privacy means? Well, we're talking about a couple different things here. First, when you use the internet, you are voluntarily transmitting some information. You are sending emails, you are sending messages, you are filling out forms on web pages, you're using apps that connect to the internet, you're uploading documents. You are voluntarily putting information online and that is fine. But online privacy means that when you do that, these intentional voluntary things, only the person or people you intend them to go to get them. If I am buying something online, I really want the vendor to have my credit card number, otherwise they can't charge me. But I don't want some kid sitting out on the street monitoring my Wi-Fi network on their laptop to get my credit card number, all right? I want to constrain who gets the information that I voluntarily put up there. I also want to avoid accidentally letting information seep out there onto the internet. So an example would be, I think I'm pasting something into a form and I make an error and I, I paste the wrong thing. I paste some sensitive information that was on my clipboard. Or I send an email with confidential information. I send it accidentally to the wrong address or I text the wrong person accidentally. People text me all the time that I've never heard of because you know somebody put in a, a wrong phone number or somebody emails me thinking I'm somebody else because uh, an email address got entered incorrectly on a form somewhere. The third element is preventing anybody from accessing your information on your computer, tablet, smartphone, whatever, without your permission. So this would be something like a botnet or hackers trying to break into your computer and steal stuff or install malware or use ransomware to encrypt everything on your computer and try to get some money out of you. So these are the things we are, we are trying to prevent. Now, um, not everyone has the same risk level as I mentioned earlier, but instead of thinking in terms of, well, I'm not a celebrity, I'm not a politician, I'm not rich, I'd like to frame this a little bit differently. In my experience, there are two types of people. Okay, no, that's just a joke. There are two types of people, those who worry too little about online privacy and those who worry too much. Now, I gave a version of this presentation a number of years ago at a user group in Pennsylvania, and there was a woman in the audience there who was extremely, extremely paranoid about her online privacy to the extent that she refuses to use email. She doesn't even have an email account. She is just desperately afraid of using the internet in any way. Now, she, she'll use her husband's email account, so there might still be some problems there. But my feeling is she's she's too worried. She's worried too much about online privacy. Uh, I believe that she's imagining threats where none exist. She's imagining herself to be more vulnerable and imagining consequences of not being private online that simply won't ever happen to her. I would urge you not to be one of those people because it makes your life much less convenient. It makes it harder to do what you have to do to live. But that's not to say that you should just say, I will enter anything anywhere. And a lot of people do. A lot of people reuse the same password on every site. That's not a very good idea. A lot of people don't worry about encrypted Wi-Fi, don't worry about encrypted web pages. They just sort of trust everything and they go anywhere and they do anything. And you don't want to be one of those either. You are worried too little about online privacy if you do that. 
We need a happy medium. We don't want to be so paranoid that our lives become difficult, but we want to be paranoid enough because you only have to look at the news to see how frequently there are data breaches and bugs found and exploits and malware and all kinds of things where the bad guys are trying to get at your stuff. Now, on the theme of not being paranoid enough, I've had people come and tell me, ah, what do I care? I have nothing to hide. My life is an open book. Well, that's great. I, I think it is fantastic for you to be open and honest, and I try to be open and honest in general as well. That doesn't mean you don't have anything to hide. And having something to hide doesn't mean you are a bad person. Think about these sorts of things. For example, maybe you really don't care if anybody knows where you live. Maybe you grew up as I did in the days where every house gets a copy of the white pages once a year and you can just go through and look up people's names and addresses and phone numbers and that's normal. Maybe that's fine with you, but what if you have the names and addresses and phone numbers and email addresses of friends and family in your address book? Maybe they don't want for random strangers to know who they are and where they live. It is your obligation to protect that personal information that you have about other people. Where you go, your medical history, your bank accounts and credit card numbers, all the websites you've ever visited, everything that's in an email you've ever sent or received, there are just some things that need to be private. It doesn't mean that you have some moral fault for wanting strangers not to have your bank account information. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person because you want to keep some things to yourself. All right, so these are the things we have to hide. Who are we trying to hide them from exactly besides everybody in the world? Well, here are some categories. The very top of the list, and this should really be probably a lot bigger and bolder, this is really like 50% of the threat is advertisers and advertising platforms. Now, for those of you who, who were just in the MeWe presentation, you, you may be familiar with the fact that Facebook is less of a social networking platform and more of an advertising platform. Facebook gets its money, the majority of its money from advertising, and it's really an advertising platform, and that's why it's in Facebook's best interest to know as much about you as possible so that they can better target ads at you and get more advertising money. It's really the same thing with Google. Well, it's really the same thing with a lot of websites and services. Anything that is driven by advertising, it's in their best interest to have as much information about you as possible because that leads to better ad targeting and more dollars. Apart from that huge category, there are others. And this is not a complete list. These are examples. I have heard of cases where you apply for insurance. It could be life insurance, let's just say. And the insurance company looks on your Facebook page or your social media and they're like, well, this person does a lot of skydiving and extreme sports and maybe illegal drag racing, whatever. You know, this person does things that might lead to an untimely death. Maybe we don't want to offer them insurance. Keep in mind that anything you post online in, in public is not just for your friends. Anybody can find it. That could be a bank that you want to get money from, could be an insurance company, could be somebody that has a grudge against you. And of course, down there at the bottom is Big Brother. And Again, you may be a person who feels you don't have anything to hide from the government and good for you. Then again, we have all heard of cases where somebody sees something and draws the wrong conclusion. They assume something that is not true. So 
in general, it's better to keep information out of hands that you don't want it to go into. In my book, Take Control of Your Online Privacy, I talk sort of a lot about how you develop a privacy strategy. We're going to summarize a few of the main points here. First step you should do is make some one-time changes. As I said earlier, these are not permanent changes that you just do them once and you're good for all time. However, you might have some bad habits that really you do need to change. You might need to change some settings in your software, turn on some privacy settings in your social media. You might need to start using a VPN. You might need to do some more or less one-time things. That's not to say you won't ever have to revisit them, but you, you may have to change some habits and uh, do a chunk of one-time things, change your passwords, those sorts of things. And then in, in terms of the habits, there are some things that you might do occasionally that you should really start doing regularly. One of the examples that I have here is logging out of your computer when you're done using it. Now, I don't mean that if, if you live alone at home and nobody else is ever in your house that you need to do that, That's that again goes into the sort of paranoid level. There, there's really no value to you in that unless somebody breaks into your house and really has a hankering to find out what websites you've been visiting. If you live in an environment where there are other people around, if you use a computer at work and there are other people in your workplace, if you go to the library or Starbucks and you're using your computer there and you get up to go to the bathroom, whatever it may be, if there is ever a situation in which somebody else can access your computer, you will want to get in the habit of logging out then. Most importantly, I want you to start thinking. When you are using your computer, tablet, smartphone, and you are about to type something in email, you're about to type something in a text message, you're about to put information in a form to buy something or for whatever purpose, before you start typing, before you click submit or before you click send, just think, a mo think for a moment about what could be the consequences? Who might see this? What would happen if the wrong person sees it? Just thinking about that, getting into the habit of being aware of what could happen to your information will, will have an interesting effect. It will, it will cause you to do a little bit of editing that might keep you out of the most serious kinds of trouble. Now, of all the different things that you might do to deal with your privacy on all of your different devices, we don't have time to cover a dozen of them. Today, I'm just gonna focus on three of them. First one is your internet connection. That is, how does the device you're using talk to the larger internet? For most of us, most of the time, it is either over Wi-Fi or over cellular, although you might still have a wired internet connection. Second area is web browsing. Most of us use the web all day, every day for a wide variety of things, and we want to use it safely. Third is email. Email is, a, a lot of people I know don't like it. They have developed bad habits. They have got a lot of spam. They have thousands or tens of thousands of messages in their inbox, but I love email. I have a really good relationship with email. I use it for a lot of things and it's very useful to me, but email is also an area where you could really, really get into trouble very easily. So we're gonna talk about that. Besides those three things, there might be one extra bonus tip and you won't like it, but it won't come as a surprise either. All right, first topic keeping your internet connection private. Now, a lot of us sort of have this image that when my computer or other device is connected to the internet, it's, it's like a, it's a, a pipe, you know, it's, it's opaque. Nobody can sort of see into it. 
that's not necessarily the case. Uh, a few years ago, I was writing a book about security and I, I did an experiment. I went to a library and I had my laptop there. Of course, all around me were other patrons with their laptops. And I used some readily available hacking tools that I just sort of did a web search and said, how, how do you do this? Well, download this thing. So I downloaded that thing and I turned it on and I started watching the Wi-Fi traffic around me the way a hacker would. And I looked at my screen and I was like, wow, I didn't know that I could know this. There's a guy, there's, there's somebody on here using a particular online backup service. And I knew that because it told me the port number and it was a unique port number. And it also showed me what kind of computer they had. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's that guy. Like over, over there with that white laptop. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's the guy who's using this online uh, backup service. I was really stunned at how much information I could learn. That's because all of us were connected to the library's network and that network didn't use a password. So the traffic, the wireless traffic was not encrypted. That's why I could do that. And that's why my first recommendation is always and only use encrypted networks if you can. If you have your own router or routers, mesh network, whatever, at home, of course, you have control over this. You can turn on encryption, WPA or WPA2 or WPA3, the newer versions are better, to encrypt all the traffic. And yes, this is going to mean you're going to have to enter the password to connect to your network. And any guest that comes over and you want to give them network access will also have to enter the password. But you enter it once. And once you've entered it, your device will store that password. You won't have to enter it again. And you will be able to prevent people like me, who just happen to be nearby, with some freely available hacking tool from finding out what you're doing. It's not bulletproof. It's not totally impregnable, but it keeps you from being an easy target. It keeps you from being low-hanging fruit. What if you are someplace where you don't have control over the network? It's not my router. I'm at a public place. I'm at a library or whatever. Then what? Ah, there's another solution for you. Use a virtual private network. You, sign, you pay some company some number of dollars per month or per year, load up their software, put in your credentials, and you click connect. Now what happens is you have created a virtual tunnel between your computer and some server out there on the internet inside of which everything is encrypted. And that encryption keeps creeps like me from seeing in from the outside by way of your Wi-Fi signals. A virtual private network will slow you down a little bit, might cost you a little bit of money, but it is a way of giving yourself that both security and privacy when you are somewhere that you don't have control over the network. You might also want to go ahead and turn on your firewall. It's a click or two. It isn't always necessary. It might not always be useful, but again, it's simple to do. There are virtually no negative consequences to doing this. And it's one more thing you can do to prevent someone from the outside of getting into your computer. Now, here is sort of a diagram of a, you know, we have the, the cloud up at the top. There's various websites and apps. That's just the internet. Like all of these servers and computers all connected together. Down at the bottom of the middle, here's you in front of your computer. And you're, let's say your computer is using Wi-Fi. So those Wi-Fi signals are going to the Wi-Fi router. Wi-Fi router will connect some way, cable, DSL, something, something, to an internet service provider. Internet service provider has the connections to the internet. Now, you'll notice that all of the lines here are these dotted gray lines. That means they're insecure. And there are people, people next door, in the car, walking by, bad guys, maybe, 
or random security researchers who can see those wireless signals. So this is you without any encryption on your network. Okay, let's say you have your own router and you turn on WPA3. Here's what you've done. You have encrypted the connection between you and the Wi-Fi router. That means all the people scanning your Wi-Fi network can't see anything. Notice there are still a lot of dotted gray lines on here. Someone could potentially hack in between the router and your internet service provider someplace. Someone could hack in between the internet service provider and the internet or somewhere else on the internet. They could potentially tap in and see what is going on, but you have at least eliminated one threat. With a virtual private network, you see it's a little bit different. The green line means, yeah, even though the Wi-Fi signal itself is not encrypted, it doesn't matter because you have a tunnel, an encrypted tunnel from your device, through your router, through your ISP, all the way deep into the internet where there is a server someplace. You have reduced the number of dotted gray lines. You have made it much harder for somebody to intercept the communication between your computer and whatever site or service you are using. It isn't perfect yet because there are still some dotted gray lines, but you have made it much harder for somebody to break in. There's no reason you can't use both. Even if you are using an encrypted Wi-Fi signal, which is good, you can also use a VPN which will be another layer of security and it will extend that security a bit farther. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of VPN providers. I'm sorry to tell you that it's, it's very hard to find one that you can trust. And the reason for that is that if you were to do a web search for VPN reviews or VPN comparison or something like that, the first million or so hits would be from disreputable companies, right? So these are people who set up websites with reviews, and I'm using the air quotes because they aren't really reviews, they're descriptions, but even if they look like they have real feature comparisons and speed tests and so forth, they're almost always made up. That's because these sites make money from affiliate links. What they want you to do is go and buy a subscription to a VPN provider. And so whichever VPN provider offers them the biggest commission, that will be the one that goes on top. All right, I have some firsthand experience with these, which I won't bore you with right now, but let's just say this is a very serious and very widespread problem. Don't believe everything you read about VPN providers because there are ulterior motives. Now, there are a few that I have researched and I feel very good about. Molvad, IVPN, Encrypt.me. If you want a trustworthy, objective opinion about other VPN providers, you can go to a site like wirecutter.com, which is part of the New York Times. You can go to wired.com or PC World, Mac World, sites run by major reputable publishing companies that do real testing and give you real unbiased advice. But if you see or smell any affiliate links, beware, that could be a scam. Part two, we have secured our wireless connection. How do we actually browse the web privately? A lot of people think that the way to browse the web privately is to use your browser's incognito mode or private browsing mode. They go by different names. I'm sorry to say that does not do what you think it does. A private browsing mode 
it, it, I don't mean to say that it's worthless, but the main thing a private browsing mode does is to prevent your device from keeping a record of where you went and what you did that somebody else could examine later. Now, if that's something that is important to you, be my guest, use the private browsing mode, use incognito. But the private browsing mode does not prevent anyone from intercepting your communication. It does not guarantee that the information you're putting on the web won't leak out somewhere. And it does not, very much does not keep you anonymous from the websites you visit. How do you browse the web privately? Well, my first recommendation is use almost any browser except for Google Chrome. I like Brave. There's also Vivaldi. There's uh, Avast has a, a fairly okay private browser. You want to avoid Chrome. You want to avoid Chrome for the very reason I talked about earlier, which is Chrome is a Google product and everything about Chrome is designed to suck information from your activities and give it to Google so that they can show you more and better ads. Google has a lot of great technology. I won't pretend that they don't, but their entire business model is based on advertising. And as I've said a few times already and may say again, successful advertising is based on building a profile of you with as much information as possible. So there are better browsers and I recommend using one. Disable third-party cookies, which are used to track you as you go from site to site to site. There's always a setting in your browser that you can disable those, but that's not good enough. Private browsing isn't good enough. You're probably also going to need to have some type of ad blocker. There are many, many of them. And I, I can't, I don't have time to give you sort of a detailed comparison, but find something that blocks ads. And the point is not simply so that an ad doesn't appear there and irritate you by interrupting the article you're trying to read. Yeah, it'll do that, but that's a side effect. The real reason to block ads is so that in the process of loading the ad, the advertiser doesn't get a bunch of information about you, including where you have been. If you aren't already using a password manager, this is an app that will generate new passwords for you and store them and sync them among your devices and fill them in automatically when needed, use a password manager. It will keep you much, much safer. Uh, there are many examples. There's 1Password and LastPass and RoboForm and Keeper and Dashlane. Pick one that you like, but use the password manager for your personal information, not just passwords. It could be credit card numbers, secure notes, anything that you want to keep out of the hands of random strangers. I also recommend using some search engine that is not Google. Google is a good search engine, other than the fact that you search for something in the top. Very many choices are, are ads or sponsored links. But there are other search engines out there, such as DuckDuckGo, that respect your privacy, that don't capture all of the information about what you're searching for to show you ads. DuckDuckGo is the one I use. Years ago, it used to be that it was a little bit unusual that you go to a website and you get that little lock icon in your, in your address bar saying that the site is encrypted with SSL or TLS. Now that's very common. Most sites are encrypted and that's terrific. Still occasionally they aren't. So if you happen to be going to a site that you don't see that lock icon on, doesn't start with HTTPS, be aware that anything that you send or receive on that website could be found by other people. If you need more privacy than what you can get simply by using a good browser and good browser settings, and a VPN, you can try Tor. <clears throat> Tor it doesn't stand for anything, although it used to stand for the onion router. It's more than I can get into right now, but it is a way of partially hiding who you are. It, again, it's not perfect, but it is a way of making it more likely that you will be more anonymous to more sites than otherwise. You can get a Tor browser, which is a sort of customized version of Firefox, but Brave also has its own built-in Tor mode that you can use 
to, uh, to mask who you are. So I'm just going to show you diagrammatically what this looks like. Here, here you are talking to one particular website. You got the lock icon. It's HTTPS. It uses SSL or TLS. That means that everything going between you and that one other site is safely encrypted. Nobody can, can tap in at any, any point along that path. That's only that one site. Your computer could still be talking to a lot of other sites and services that aren't encrypted, but that keeps that particular connection encrypted. Now, what Tor does is similar to what we saw earlier with a VPN, in that there is an encrypted pipe between your computer, goes all the way through the router, the ISP, and instead of going to one particular server out there on the internet, it goes into a network, which is thousands, tens of thousands of other people who are also using Tor. And one of those randomly chosen computers is the one that connects to the website that you're trying to get to. What makes this different from a VPN is that because the computer that is actually making the connection to the server changes all the time and is randomly chosen, partly this, this masks who you are and where you are, but also it makes you much harder to track, makes it much harder for the website or anyone between the Tor network and the website and to, to tell who you are and what you're doing. All right, the last major area I wanna to touch on very, very briefly is email privacy. And the first thing I wanna say about this is think twice before using email. If there is some information that you need to send someone that is private, that is sensitive, ask yourself whether email is the best way. If you are a Mac user or an iOS user, maybe you should use the Messages app. You can use WhatsApp, you can use Signal. There are end-to-end -end encrypted messaging systems that you can use that are much, much, much more secure than email. If you do need to use email, there are ways of encrypting your message between yourself and the recipient. I'm gonna just be honest and say they're awkward. They are hard to set up and they're hard to use in some cases. And you have to make sure that the other person is using the same one and they're going to have to go through that awkward setup as well. It's possible, it's not easy. But most importantly, if I send a wonderfully encrypted email message to you and nobody could see it when it's on my computer or on the internet or on mail servers, once it gets to you, I don't know what you're gonna do with it. Maybe you'll post it publicly. Maybe you'll leave it up on your screen and walk away from your computer. Maybe you'll back it up insecurely. You can never control what the other person does. So it is always safest to assume that anything you send by email could be read by other people. Now, I mentioned earlier, there might be a bonus tip. Here it is. You're not going to be surprised because it's, you're especially not going to be surprised if you heard the previous presentation, but you might not like it. And the bonus tip is this. Don't use Facebook. No, seriously, don't use Facebook. Of all of the companies out there that are driven by advertising and that want your private information and that have been known to do some questionable things ethically with private information, Yes, I can tell you stories about Amazon, I can tell you stories about Twitter, and I can tell you, tell you stories about Google, but really, Facebook is so far beyond all the other others that it's not even a comparison. Facebook is just the worst when it comes to privacy, and I know it's not just a matter of, well, I need to sign up for MeWay. Of course, you can do that. You should do that, but all your friends are on Facebook and the companies that you do business with are on Facebook. I know it's not easy to move away from Facebook, but how much is your privacy worth? If it's worth more than a trivial amount, really, you want to avoid Facebook and that will do more than everything else I've told you today to protect your online privacy. You know that saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Oh, well, there is a version of that for your online privacy too, only it's a little bit more insidious. What happens on the internet stays on the internet. 
What I mean by this is once you have posted something on social media, you've sent something by email, you've filled in something in a web form, you have exposed information in any way to the internet, you can't take it back. You can try to delete something, but you don't know that somebody else hasn't already made a copy of it or a backup or a screenshot. You have to assume that anything you expose to the internet is going to stay on the internet forever. And that is why you should be very, very circumspect and cautious before you post anything online. As I said, hey, there's a book about this and there is a code you can use to save 30%. Now I wanna mention uh, this book is a little bit outdated. It was uh, last updated a couple of years ago. I'm going to be uh, putting out a new edition of it in the next few months or so, but don't worry if you buy the ebook now and you agree to receive email from us, I will send you an email when the new edition is ready and you'll get it for free. Okay, so nothing to lose by buying now. And with that, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. If uh, I think we have a few minutes to answer any questions that you may have, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Turn this part to Judy. I have several questions, but I was answering them okay. uh, as you were giving the information. <laughs> Thank you. So Makes my life that, easier. That worked for me. Uh, the one thing is a couple of people, Mike and John, both use Proton Mail. Is that something that you find is a good alternate to Gmail and everything else that's out there? Yeah, Proton Mail is good. So Proton Mail is uh, is encrypted email. And what's nice about Proton Mail is that it, uh, unlike trying to set up encrypted email in something like Outlook or Apple Mail or Thunderbird, it, it's it's just on. Like you 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 sign up, you log in, and and everything is encrypted. Having said that, I want to repeat that warning from earlier that you can't control what the other person does. So you can make sure that the email you're sending out is encrypted, but once the other party has decrypted it in order to read it, anything could happen. Now, I, I would certainly feel much more secure knowing that all of my email messages are sitting encrypted on a secure server with ProtonMail than I would with say Gmail or Yahoo Mail because you have to worry about not just the messages while they're in transit, but anything that you actually store on the server. Well, I have, I have hundreds of thousands of messages stored on a mail server. So uh, ProtonMail is a good one. It isn't free and, and that's okay because if you've heard the saying a million times, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. The only reason that, that Gmail and the like are free is that they're making, those companies are making the money from advertising and they're doing that by being aware of what you do online. So I think uh, ProtonMail or any of several others in that sort of same category are, are probably uh, well worth paying for. Uh, doesn't Windows 10 have the firewall turned on automatically? It may. It's actually, you know, like you, you turn on stuff and you're like, wait a minute, what was that turned on before? Or was it turned? What was what was the default? Like once, it's been a while. I don't know. It might. It might be turned on by default. Yes, up and say you you actually use Macs all the time. Yes, I I am I am normally <laughs> a Mac user, although I. I run Windows as well. Okay. Um, should you use a VPN when you are on the network, when you are home, wired into your router modem? You, I mean, it, let me put it this way. It, it won't hurt, except if, except in the sense that a VPN can slow down your connection. So if you're doing high-res streaming video, or if you're doing online gaming where you have to have the lowest possible latency, it is conceivable that it might degrade your performance in a noticeable way. It doesn't do any harm. It makes it that much less likely that someone 
could could see what you're doing. I wouldn't say that it's mandatory. Uh, one of the things you can do with most VPN providers is choose a server in another part of the country or another part of the world. So if you wanted to watch, uh, let's say, videos from the BBC or from uh, CBC in Canada, and this video content is only available to people who live in that country, you could pretend to be in that country using a VPN. So there are, there are situations like that where there are advantages to using a VPN, even if you're on a wired network at home. But I wouldn't say it's, it's super necessary for privacy reasons. I've used private internet access for about four years. Is that an okay one? I used to recommend private internet access. And then I found out that the, the company was acquired very, very, uh, it was a very, very low key thing such that if you weren't really, really paying attention, you wouldn't have noticed. And the company that now owns it has done some pretty questionable things that I don't feel good about. So one thing I can say about private internet access, historically, at least you know, with, at least with the previous owners, is that Government agencies, law enforcement have, have taken this company to court to try to get records of where various subscribers have, have gone. And they, all those lawsuits failed because the company literally doesn't keep records. There, there, there are no logs to share. So that aspect of it is nice that has been tested in court that they're, you know, they, they don't have anything to share with, with uh, those sorts of entities. But again, that was with the old owners and the new owners I'm a little more concerned about. So I, I would tend not to recommend them anymore. Correct. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to open it up for um, live Q&A now. I have a lot of questions for Mike and some more for you, but let's open it up for live Q&A. And if you uh, asked a question in the chat box, I will be sending those questions to either Mike or Joe, and then I, that will be included in the entire Q&A, including comments that I send out to everybody. So, John, can you unmute all the people? Already done, and remind them that if you want to have a chance to share and talk, go to your reactions button across the taskbar at the bottom of Zoom and click raise hand because then you go right to the top of the list of the hundred and some people so we can find you if you want to uh, share with us. I'll start with one while they're thinking and raising their hands. Uh, uh, Joe, how do we use that coupon code? Where do we go to order the book? Or oh, I, any will, books? I will be sending the coupon code out to everybody. All right. right. So, so what will happen is you go to the site, you put whatever books you want in the cart and you click the cart icon. You're about to check out and there's a little uh, coupon code field there and you just uh, type or paste that code in there before you, uh, before you click checkout. We are having a drawing at the end of our live chat for a free copy. Over to Jim. Holly, would you unmute yourself, please? Okay, I'm I'm unmuted. Uh, my question was: I, I just recently saw a thing that uh, I guess C, when I when I re or bought a new license for C Cleaner, uh, they had uh, advertised Camo K A M O as a way to scramble your computer fingerprint uh, when when you go to some other site. Is does that, are you familiar with that or is that, uh, is that something that's uh, worthwhile or what? I am not familiar with Camo in particular, but I am familiar with browser fingerprinting. And basically this is a sneaky way that advertisers and other people can figure out who you are, even if you block cookies. So they're gonna say, well, we don't know this person's name, but we do know that it's a person with this operating system and this size monitor at this bit depth, 
and these browser extensions and these fonts installed, they like get all this information about the unique combination of stuff that's on your computer. And then when they see that unique combination again, they say, oh, that's, that's that guy. And so they can track you by, by noticing all the unique characteristics of your computer and your browser. So in general, any tool that will, will obscure that information is a great idea because that makes it harder to track you. I, I don't know about Camo in particular, but I do know that there are a number of uh, tools and, and even browsers out there that, that do that function. That's spelled K-A-M-O. Okay, I'll have to uh, uh, look it up. Can I throw in another question? Do you keep your sensitive financial information on a cloud or do you on or do you just keep it on paper at home or what do you do? How do you protect all that information? Uh, I definitely do not keep sensitive financial information in the cloud. I have my sensitive financial information on my computer. My computer is encrypted. I do back it up to the cloud and my backups are encrypted. So the, the data is encrypted before it ever leaves my computer. It stays encrypted while it's in transit, stays encrypted on the servers. But I, I don't put sensitive financial documents, for example, in, in Dropbox or Google Drive or you know, OneDrive or a place like that. Uh, that, that would... I, uh, that <laughs> except, <laughs> except for the back, except for the encrypted backups, is that what yeah, they're encrypted, right? So the backups, uh, I happen to use Backblaze for online backups, and that uh, securely encrypts everything before it leaves your computer. And uh, you have to go to a little bit of extra effort with Backblaze to use your own private encryption key so that even the company can't get at your files, but but I do. So uh, I, 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 I'm I very, very careful with sensitive financial documents. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Over to Dale. Dale, will you unmute yourself, please? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if he had, um any idea of how to get people, you know, from like, if you have to change your hot, from Hotmail or whatever to ProtonMail, um, how do you, or from Facebook to MeWe, whatever, how do we get that all changed over? Because, uh, you know, there's so many links um, that um, are connected to that. Yeah, it's hard. I, I, won't, I won't try to sugarcoat this. It's, it's very difficult because you're not just changing stuff for yourself. You're changing your social media and email involves other people. So even if it's just email, you could you could send an, an email message to everybody in your address book like, hey, I have a new email address. Please start using this now. People hate getting those, but you can do that. But think about all of the different companies, websites, newsletters, like you know, all the all different places you have shared your email address. Trying to uh, change all of those is is a project, and with social media like like switching from Facebook to MeWe, well, again, there's just like the effort of doing all that. But it's not just that; it's the fact that if the if the, your friends and relatives and the people you care about are on Facebook and they're not on MeWe, uh, it's a lot of work. One of these days. I really would like to write a book on exactly that topic and specifically like moving away from Facebook to something else because it's not simple. I can't, I can't just say, well, here's the three easy steps and it'll take you an hour and you're done. No, it's, it's involved. It's involved, but in my opinion, it's, it's worth the effort. So I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a simple answer to you. I am, I am acknowledging that there is some pain involved. If, if the I other can, question if I, I can... wanted to know was if, um, uh, do you have any recommendations for like, if you just want someone to go through and clean up your computer and, and uh, help you establish a VPN and all this other thing, um, are there some trusted vendors or people that do that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm sure there must be, but I, I do not personally do that sort of thing. And I, 
I'm afraid I don't know the answer, like who, who, who it is that you could trust. Uh, I believe Mike had something he wanted to say to your, to your last question though. Yeah, if I can just share my screen for 30 seconds. Uh, I went on to MeWe while we were discussing the transition period. And I'll just, I'll share real quick and then I'll jump back off again. Um, Tell us how you uh, transferred your friends, so to speak, over to MeWe. I know you talked about it in your presentation, but kind of right. go over that again for to answer that question specifically. The, every, every person who joins MeWe, if you see right here on the screen, has their personal link. <clears throat> and you know, it's the little I in the middle. So that's actually in my email signature right now. And, and to people I send email out that I wish to, to have join me on MeWe, they can just click on that. They get an invitation. If they're not already on MeWe, they'll be invited to, to do it, you know, the 30-day free trial. Also, it's, it can be posted on any of the social networks you're leaving. And if, if, in fact, everybody who's in your address book, and that's not necessarily true, but if everybody in the address book is somebody that you would want to be a comment on MeWe, you can upload your contacts and you can synchronize them. And if they're already on MeWe, they won't get a duplicate. They'll, they'll synchronize with friends that are already there. So I started from fresh just with my link. But you can, if you wish, if you have a small contact group, you can actually um, export and import. Oh, cool, thank you. And Dale, the best uh, people to ask about um, help with your uh, computer with a vendor locally is the members of your uh, computer club. They will undoubtedly have firsthand information on who you should or should not trust uh, to do work on your computer. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Judy, in the co uh, response to the part about switching like from Gmail to uh, uh, Proton Mail, since I'm the Proton user and have been for a number of years, it, it wasn't an immediate uh, switch over. You know, I started telling people, use this address, please. And then a couple times I'd have to remind them, I'm using this one now. And I said, I usually tell them, if you write it the other one, I might get to it eventually. And the other thing is that, that uh, uh, Joe put out or mentioned about uh, all the other things that have your email. That was a process too. As I go to the doctor's office each time and have to update your uh, information, then I go and update the Proton Mail. And then the next time I'm on some other website that has my um, email address, update it. So I'm not a hundred percent switched over, but you know, I'm I'm probably 85, 90%, and most people are, you know, responding that way. So just excellent idea. I'm gonna add that to my repertoire of you know, sending an email out to everybody, like Joe had said. Uh, Joe, Diane would like to know if you have a recommendation for a password manager. Yeah, uh, I personally use one password. It's, uh, I've, I've used it for many years. I, I even wrote a book about it. Uh, I've, I've tried dozens of password managers, and there are some really good ones. I know that, I mean, it's partly a matter of personal preference, personal taste. Uh, you, you certainly want to pick one that runs on all the platforms you use. Uh, 1Password runs on pretty much everything. It runs on Linux and Windows and Mac and Android and iOS and probably other things, Chromebooks, you know, it runs on pretty much everything. Uh, I, I happen to like the user interface. I happen to like the feature set. If something else seems better to you, almost all of them have free trials you can download. They're either free for a limited time or free for, a, a fixed number of passwords. Uh, some of some of the really well known one, known ones are LastPass and uh, Dashlane and RoboForm and Keeper. I mean, it doesn't hurt to download a few. Try try one out. See how that is. Uh, turn that off. Turn it on. You don't want to have like two or three of them going at once because that can be really confusing. But uh, put a few passwords in one of them. See how that is for you try a different one. But if I had to recommend 
just one, I would say one password. And I understand that has never been hacked. Not to my knowledge. And the one thing that Joe says in his password manager presentation that is extremely important for seniors who want to think they can still remember it all <laughs> and really don't want to let go and is to, you don't have to put all your passwords in your a password manager. And that means, you know, think your brain stays, stays active, so to speak, but you're not giving over complete control to a password manager. You still do have it. You can remember some passwords. And Mike, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, you mentioned something about Google Docs. How can this be considered to be private, MeWe, if when Google is involved? That's a good question. Uh, I am still researching uh, MeWe Pro, so it's an ongoing uh, process right now. Uh, I don't personally use Google Docs. I'm using Word or I'm using OpenOffice or LibreOffice. But apparently the collaboration is designed to compete with, but still be compatible with those who are using Google Docs, as well as those that are using Office 365. So... If in fact the, the collaboration of MeWe Pro is seamless, and if it allows real-time online collaboration of documents and spreadsheets and presentations, that looks pretty interesting. And especially if a nonprofit gets it for free. Again, something I'm researching. Uh, over to Jim for a question. Uh, going back to one pass for just a minute, uh, one password as a, a to save your passwords. Do you mm -hmm. is that one that uh, is sort of independent of the uh, browsers? I sometimes use more than one browser per session. Do I have to do I have to go ahead and put in the master password every time I go to a new browser? Like I think that's how you have to do it on LastPass. So that's that's a great question and. In fact, almost every browser has its own built-in password manager. Chrome has its own password manager and Firefox has its own and Safari has its own. And one of the reasons I recommend an independent app, not one of the ones that is built into a browser is because I switch browsers all the time. And I would rather have I would rather not have to, you know, have separate lists of passwords and have them sort of, you know, sandbox from each other. Now, 1Password has, has two modes of operation. This, this may be a little bit inside baseball, but like there is a version of 1Password that exists solely as a browser extension. So in that version of 1Password, you, you, you log, let's say you put the extension in Chrome. And let's say you also put the extension in Brave. Okay, so when you go into to Chrome, you'll unlock that and, and all of your passwords are encrypted, stored in the cloud, and then Chrome has access to all those. And when you log into Brave, you'll, you'll need to do the same thing. That's one mode of operation. A separate mode of operation, which is available uh, certainly on Mac and Windows, I'm not positive about Linux, but a separate mode of operation is you have a standalone app, the one password app, and then you have a, what they call the, their classic extension where the extension doesn't do all the work. The extension isn't communicating with the cloud. Rather, your standalone app is the repository on your computer. And the only purpose of the extension is to communicate between the standalone app and the browser. So in that mode, once you've unlocked the app once, you can switch browsers all you want to, and it'll stay unlocked until you lock it, or you can set you know a timeout automatically lock after this period of time. So that's the way I prefer to use one password because exactly what you describe, you unlock it once and then do whatever you do, switch browsers, it's all good. You use the, the browser, the, that version of the extension. If you don't want the extra hassle and weight of that uh, standalone app, and you just want to be in your browser all the time, and especially if you mostly stay in the same browser, then you can use that other version of the extension, and and that's and it's fine. Also, yeah, most 
I think most most websites uh, recommend that you close the browser after you have exited that website for security reasons. I believe is that uh, does that sound right? You know, and if I if I do that every time, then every time I go back and use that browser, then I have to if I'm using LastPass, I think I have to put in the master password. So what's yeah. the saving? I, I, mean, I uh, think it's, I would say that closing the browser after visiting a website is unnecessary. I, I think that's an excessive level of, of you know, paranoia or whatever. I, I, would, I would sort of ignore those messages, honestly, myself. But be that as it may, I, I still do like the model where you unlock something globally and then it's unlocked. I think so too, and one pass allows you to do that. Yes, it does. Yes, that one password. I mean, yes. Thanks. Thank you. Doug, unmute yourself, please. Yes. Good afternoon. Hi. I was wondering what Joe thought of OpenVPN, and also a secondary question. <clears throat> Somebody once told me that yes, you are in a tunnel up until the VPN, but it's possible that if you're on your bank account, for argument's sake there may be unencrypted information between the VPN and the bank itself. Okay. Is that true? So, let, me ask, let me answer the second part of that first. It is true that a VPN does not encrypt your connection all the way between your computer and whatever website you're going to. That, that part of it is true. The VPN itself is only a secure tunnel between your computer and the VPN server. However, if you are on a bank website or or most other websites that are connect that are uh, that use SSL, HTTPS, you know, with the yes. lock icon, it doesn't matter because that connection between your computer and that particular website is is encrypted whether or not you're using a VPN. What a VPN adds is encrypting all the other connections. It also encrypts data that your, uh, your computer is sending and receiving to other websites and email and other kinds of things that aren't that specific encrypted website. So it, it's true that a VPN doesn't give you end-to-end -end encryption, but if you're talking about a bank or financial website, it doesn't matter because the SSL or TLS that the, that the website uses is what provides that end-to-end -end encryption. So, now, so therefore, it's safe to use your bank at Starbucks. Yeah. Oh, I do. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Back to the first now, question, please. You asked about OpenVPN, and I, I have heard of it. Uh, OpenVPN is one of, you know, uh, a bunch of VPN providers. What OpenVPN is, if, if memory serves, it's actually sort of two things. It's, a, a, it's sort of a protocol. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a method of, of making a VPN connection that you could host on your own server if you were so inclined, or you can pay this company to use that protocol on their hosted cloud service. Glad now, the, the, the protocol itself is fine. I do not have experience using OpenVPN as, as a cloud service, like paying for their particular version of this. I, I just don't have any data on that. So I don't know whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. But as far as the protocol itself goes, that's fine. Mike, the question for you. Oops. Thank you. I was yep. just going to comment on, on uh, just add to Joe's uh, comment. I just recently learned that open that um, Proton's VPN, uh, which is both free and you can pay for a premium version, um, uses Open VPN because I installed it on a Linux computer, and when I went to the networking app and enabled it, I could see in the description it said using Open VPN, and then there was a whole bunch of technical information. So apparently, however they set it up. They set it up with the open VPN protocols. Uh, Mike, is a signal app or telegraph app a good alternative to WhatsApp? Well, as I mentioned, WhatsApp 
was designed specifically to be voice over IP telephony using a telephone. Many people use voice over IP with a little adapter that they have at home plugged into their router and then a telephone number that, that's unique to that adapter. This actually puts that app on your computer or on your phone. Signal, uh, and I think, what was the other one? Telegraph, telephone? Yeah. I, yeah. Both of those are chatting devices, uh, are chatting apps. Now, I have not researched them deep enough to know if they offer true VOIP uh, connections. So uh, the, the, the claim to fame of WhatsApp, and other than the fact that it's now vulnerable to sharing your private information with Facebook, um, is that it's a very easy to use VPN, uh, excuse me, uh, VOIP uh, app. I'll just, jump, I'll just jump in and add to that. Um, Edward Snowden, who, who we are all familiar with, whether you like him or hate him, he recommends Signal. So he, he considers that for his needs to be a, a more secure alternative than WhatsApp. So you can take that for whatever it's worth. And especially now that it's associated with, that WhatsApp's associated with Facebook. Correct, yeah. And I think Snowden also said if the government had used passphrases, he couldn't have gotten the information he did. There you go. John gets oh. the last question. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's more of a comment on our uh, one path and stuff. Uh, we've had workshops and a number of us use uh, Bitwarden. And in Bitwarden, just like what Joe has, is, you know, has the two different parts, browser-based and uh, client-based. But in the idea of the talking about shutting the browser, in, in the Bitwarden settings, I think you can set it so that it doesn't shut down for X number of minutes after you've closed the browser. So if you close it, open it back up, it's still connected and you don't have to re-put the password in. So you just have to check your particular uh, password manager and look at the settings, you know, go in there and read them, that they're yours, and see what all it can do and how it works best for you. Right, and if I'm not mistaken, Bitwarden is actually free. Yep. So if if you are testing the waters of a password manager and you think you're something you really want to do, but you just really don't want to invest any money until you're sure, uh, that's that's a good way to get started. Yeah. And Bob G does recommend having two in case one goes down. <laughs> he didn't want to be in the lurch for any reason. Um, you guys, this was a great session today with the two presentations. Uh, thank you so much, Mike and Joe. And uh, Dale, I'm going to be sending uh, Joe's information out to everybody. And we're going to have a drawing for a free book. I'll figure out how to do this. And this is one of our really cool APCUG drawings. Hey, John, can you yell up the stairs to Betty and ask her to choose a number between 1 and 94? I, I already picked the number because she wasn't here earlier. It's 71. 71. And see, this is how we do our drawings. I call John and say, have Betty check, you know, between here and here. Okay. Lindsay, are you still here? Because some people have left since I did my screenshots. Over to Lindsay. She is the winner of our raffle, and she belongs to a, a BCUG, Brookdale Computer User Group. And I will be getting in touch. Leah, did you have another one? I'd, I'll let you in since I saw your hand up. Leah Clark, yeah. unmute yeah. yourself. You're still muted. There you go. No, I had just put up a, cl a clapping hand to uh, thank everybody <laughs> for uh, a thumbs up hand. Oh, okay. My thank eyes, you know. Great workshop. <laughs> <laughs> we, can't, we can't trust John's eyes quite not, yet. Not for another week. <laughs> and for those of you who are your program chairs for your groups, Joe does is a member of our Speakers Bureau, and you can check the list and see the presentations that he gives. They are all excellent as you saw today.
And I'll ask Mike, Mike, hey, I'm always looking for new people for the Speakers Bureau, okay? <laughs> or if I, you have another I'll, presentation I'll accept, topic I'll accept that you would in, like to do. I'll accept invitations and let's see how it fits in with my very busy schedule. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, hey, people fill out the Speakers Bureau form and you say yay or nay. But I'll tell you right now, don't ask for the second Monday uh, evening of the month. <laughs> He's busy. I like second to thank the, second that Wednesday. That must be the new Linux thing. thing. Yeah. That, that is. Second Wednesday. Yeah. Second Wednesday. Outstanding. Hey, yeah. John. Thanks, everybody, for coming. There. And it's amazing. We're at the end of uh, May, another month of workshops. We already have a couple of workshops planned for next month and one for in July, because that's the Linux ones. We can always plan ahead. And so uh, watch your uh, mail after the first of the month with information about our next workshops and registration for those. And uh, if you have, here's our always closing remarks. If you are any ideas about future workshops, and I got, you know, Judy and I have a, a bunch of them. We just need to get the people to, to uh, do it. Um, if you have ideas, please submit it. And more important, if you are interested in doing one or being part of a team, please let us know and we will definitely get you hooked up with a couple of other people and a workshop scheduled for the future. Uh, other than that- um, As a final question or comment. Okay, Jim. Yeah, is there a way to get to uh, access to the previous workshops uh, that were recorded? Everything is uh, on APCUG's YouTube channel. Actually, oh. everything's up there from 2012. Yeah, usually, usually the, the workshops don't get up to the YouTube in public. It's in a, what's it called? Not private, it's a unlisted because the people who attend the workshop get first dibs at reviewing that. And then everything gets moved up to the more public side. So yeah, they'll be up there. Otherwise, well, I'm, interested, yeah. I'm interested in the ones that tell how to get started on Linux. <laughs> oh, those are those are up there. Go go yeah. look at playlist. Yeah, I have okay, them in a, a playlist. And Jim, our our Central Florida Computer Society Linux SIG is just started, and we literally just put Linux on a notebook last time, and we're going to continue with that. So if there's a way to to get my email, or I, I don't mind saying it online, you're more than welcome to join us. It's on the second Wednesday night uh, of each month. Uh, Mike, I will put your email on one of the emails I send out uh, about a Linux workshop, okay? Okay. Sounds good. All right. And, so and so did, you record, you, did you record that first session? Yes, I did. So we'll, we'll, okay. we'll try to set up communication and, and get that to you. Thank you very much. Good. All right, then. I thank everybody for taking time out of their day to join us and uh, keep the word going. Let all your friends who are club members, because this is a feature <clears throat> benefit of membership into one of the member clubs for APCUG. And until next time, we'll see everybody later. <laughs>